Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Firon. You may recall, at least several times early in our podcasting, we introduced the fundamental or the basic way that we've been thinking about practice. We made a tweak, an important change in this conversation. The word is increasingly. You'll discover as you listen how that treatment brings the meaning of practice more fully into what's real to us on a day-to-day basis. At least I hope that's what we accomplish. Listen in and decide for yourselves. Well, one thing that I've really enjoyed in our collaboration over these weeks and now months, Peter, is that we're never certain that we've got everything we want to say just right. And how could we? And so it means we're involved in continuous improvement, continuous refinement. And uh, I think I say somewhere in, in what I've written about practice, a concept of practice, that in fact, the more you think about anybody's practice, the more interesting it gets, the more complex and, and subtle uh, what that practitioner is doing becomes, and it's kind of a, it's kind of an open-ended uh, um, understanding and process of understanding that that we're involved in with any practice. You never fully comprehend a practice, and maybe that practitioner never fully comprehends it either. Right. Uh, we, we've certainly heard some of your favorite golfers claim that they've never they they're just they're just beginners and and they don't really understand the game yet and so forth having just won the british open or something so i interrupted go ahead no no not at all i i i think what what we are is we're sort of uh, putting a mirror up to ourselves as we talk about those practitioners and how they're quite fully getting it, or we don't quite fully get what practice means, more thought comes, which makes it a, makes it a lot more interesting. Hopefully it does. I think, it, I think that's what keeps a lot of practitioners in the game. Exactly. You know, it's just that one more try, uh, just see what happens. And, uh, and then once it happens. So let me go back to our way of thinking that the seminal way of thinking that got a lot of these other conjectures on the rails. And let's see if there are some improvements that could be made. Practice is the conscious ability fairly consistently to produce intended results and to do so across a range of circumstances and to do so while growing and changing oneself. Love that one. To meet the changing circumstances in which one's practice exists. Hey, it's perfect. We can't possibly improve it. <laughs> nice job. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to mess with it, do we? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> How would you mess with it? Because well, I think it, it uh, really it kind of hangs there as a as is this like something carved in stone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, as we have kind of repeated it to ourselves and to our listeners uh, as as these podcasts have proceeded i've i've developed a feeling that this um way of thinking mixes two things and and while they're related they're not the same thing one one thing is the nature of practice and what practice does and the circumstances under which practice exists and so forth and how practice is is uh, the production of intended results, all, all descriptors of the nature of practice. But the other thing that, that our way of thinking does is, it, is it, it commits a practitioner to being very conscious and to being very growth-minded and open to change and uh, willing to do what he or she needs to do in order to keep up with the changing circumstances in which the practice exists and so on and so on. In other words, that the, the pra- that our practitioner 
in this in this uh, way of thinking is a, is a pretty heady person. And as we've gone along, I've started to say to myself, and maybe some of our listeners have said it to themselves long since, uh, what about practitioners that aren't very conscious comparatively? Uh, what about practitioners who aren't paying a lot of attention to their growth and 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 ability to to change not that they're bad practitioners they're just not really doing the things that that our way of thinking uh, commits them to doing so we need to remember i guess that the practitioner is a human being practitioners have different levels of experience they have different tolerances for ambiguity and and uh, uncertainty uh, they work in environments that have different levels of of uh, instability and and indeed threat and um, challenge and so, and so they're not they're not always the same person and they're not always as um, conscious and effective as our way of thinking commits them to being so I think we need to maybe talk about our practitioner a little bit more yes and and maybe say some more about what we mean by growing and changing to meet the changing circumstances or what what do we mean by uh, increasing their ability to produce intended results improve their batting average so to speak because I mean I think truth be told most practitioners would would admit that their their uh, attempt to produce the intended results of their practice is not always successful. And we need, to, we need to be conscious ourselves of that so that we don't make our, our practitioner to be um, super prac, uh, <laughs> you know, some kind of magical being, some kind of magical being who uh, can do no wrong. I could just see how that could turn all of our offerings here into something that sounds like a sermon or some kind of idealistic uh, intention that we have for everyone to be that kind of ascending practitioner or super prac as you call them, her or him. But that's not what has, I think, been our intention from the beginning. First and foremost, I think we're, we, looked at the under attention of or the insufficient attention to practice when we talk about theory and practice that kind of got us going then as we got to look deeper into the nature of practice we were looking at the big p <laughs> the one that That's represents right. all practices right so within that big p there's a tremendous range of proficiency maybe uh excellence and that I'm, a, I'm i agree with you i'm afraid that it sounds like we're saying hey you're not there yet you need to listen to us we're going to tell you how to get there this this is not that kind of a of a show or we're we're not going to tell you how to get there it's your problem <laughs> that's exactly it so what about this range of or levels of uh, of growth that each of us in in a practice is responsible for, mainly responsible for. How would that change our working definition? Do you have some thoughts on, on how we could put that same way of thinking out there, but something that provides a little bit more hope <laughs> to those of us, as I am in golf, who are just about <laughs> started at getting there. I'm playing at it. <laughs> I'm not yet a golfer. I'm playing at golf. So, what 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 we do with that uh, working? Uh, working well, out? you're reminding me one of my dear friends, Jerry Harvey. Now now, unfortunately departed, was an avid golfer, and um, considered golf a spiritual experience. <laughs> but he'd come back from he'd come back from to the office from having played in the afternoon or in the morning, and um, talk about how close he had come to breaking 80, 80. Breaking 80 was his primary objective. And uh, it was his measure of success as a practitioner of the game. 
So I don't know what your number is. <laughs> uh, mine, mine, when I played, which was not very much, mine was, I think, 100. And I didn't break it very often. Yeah. But that's because I wasn't a serious practitioner, I think, of the game. So part of what has to be in the mix is the game itself and the extent to which one is serious about the game itself, not just becoming better per se, but something that there's a hook in the game. And the game isn't just a golf or a sport. The hook could be for thousands of our former students, business itself as a game, <laughs> a very competitive sure. and very dynamic game, which uh, could therefore, once one has hooked onto that, bring out a lot of effort to become better, uh, maybe by necessity, uh, get better or else in some businesses, particularly very small businesses. Uh, so let's go to that, uh, that working, uh, the way of thinking to see if just a few things we've said to each other now suggest uh, a little tweak or two. Well, I haven't got this formulated into a, into a, a paragraph of, deathless prose that I would, would stand behind. But the word that has come to my mind that belongs in two or three places in our working definition or working way of thinking is the word increasingly, increasingly conscious ability. And that implies that, that somehow over a period of time, a practitioner is improving his or her conscious ability. Another place in our way of thinking that I put the word increasingly was in the in the phrase we talk about in producing intended results so that the practitioner is able to fairly fairly consistently and increasingly produce intended results, improve the batting average, so to speak. Uh, oh, and to, uh, by the way, I, we need to bear in mind that not all practices and probably maybe even the majority of practices don't have a clear cut uh, criterion of, of uh, effectiveness, mm -hmm. a score, so to speak. Many practices do, but, but many, many don't. So the intended results become a more holistic idea that the practitioner has in his or her mind to produce, of, of what the intended results are. And maybe as an external observer, we, we would need to spend a fair amount of time interviewing that practitioner and, and uh, observing their practice in order to understand what intended results meant for that person. This reminds me of one time when I got, began to get concerned about the famous Vin, Vince Lombardi quote, uh, winning isn't the only, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. And somebody asked him if he had said that, and he said, no, but I wish I had. But because of the nature of perception, I came up with the following. Uh, winning is only the thing you think winning is. Because so many, I think I've talked about this in an earlier podcast, so many practitioners have different criteria in their minds for what the intended results are and whether their batting average is improving. And then a third place where the, uh, where the uh, word increasing or something like it needs to be inserted is around the idea of growing and changing oneself to meet the changing circumstances in which one's practice exists. I think practitioners are probably all over the map in terms of their, the effort that they're making and the form of the effort they're making and the time period over which they're making these efforts to grow and change oneself. And I suspect many practitioners are making New Year's resolutions regularly about something they're gonna to try to improve on oh, in, yeah. their, in their practice. So I've done, as, as have you done, a lot of educating and training 
both in the classroom and in organizational training environments, like some of these uh, whiz bang training training centers that various organizations, corporations, public agencies have have built whole campuses to train their people. Mm-hmm. And you and I have been in those environments. Um, the inside of a general of the General Electric uh, Management Development Centers up on the Hudson River, as I knew them some years ago, were just like the inside of a Harvard Business School classroom in, in their design. But anyway, we've been in these environments and we've known these men and women who are very earnestly working on growing and changing themselves to meet the changing circumstances. Sometimes it's just their knowledge they're trying to improve or their skill. But oftentimes it's it's personal development. It's um it's it's the development of consciousness. It's the development of ethical sensitivities. I've spent some time doing training in so called encounter groups or sensitivity training groups or whatever you want to call them where quite a bit of personal sharing goes on and tears indeed get shed by men and women who are outwardly successful practitioners and yet they're struggling with something in their practice or in their lives that is causing them a fair amount of of stress and they're expecting and hoping that the um, course they're sitting in or the program they're sitting in that you and I might be at the front of the room for or on the side of the room will help them. It's their, it's their earnestness that, that uh, always impresses me. And this is especially true of some of the men and women from other countries who are their, their usually the, it's their corporation has sent them to America to an MBA program or a doctoral program or or a um, non-academic training program of some kind. And they are so determined to, to, to develop and to grow and to change. They want so badly to get the best of what's available. It increases my feeling of responsibility to the point where I almost have to remind myself that I'm not perfect and it's not my, it's not my practice. It's their practice. Right. Uh, I'm not going to save their lives. My practice is to do the best I can. So all of this is to say that growing and changing to meet the changing circumstances in which one's practice exists is a, is a, is a widely varied set of behaviors and going back to the beginning of our way of thinking, we would hope that this set of behaviors is conscious. It isn't. It isn't just reflexive, but it it may it may be just simply a reaction or a reflection to the world they're living in, and, and not be as conscious as we might wish it were. Well, it seems to me that first that changing circumstance hits you, and if if you're unaware altogether and you're not seeking to know what's going on and what's up ahead, then you may not change very much, but it may, the thing that later on uh, you wish you had spent more time looking into. So that's one thought, but, but this notion of awareness of self assigned obligation to become more capable in a particular line of practice. You've talked about some people who you know from, in fact, they've come a long way and a great sacrifice to be in a teaching learning situation earnestly. So it's pretty clear that their intentions ride high. But for the hundreds of thousands of other people who are just plugging along, it's hard for me to figure out how they can t- go from reaction to intention to saying, here's another moment where I can make something better of myself in a big way or a small way. I always preach, if I'm back to preaching, that if you can do that for yourself, life gets a lot more interesting and 
fact, you do get better. But without that conscious attention to make sense, I don't know if you can still uh, meet the other parts of your added word increasingly. I don't know that the increasing just happens. It has to come through intention. What do you think? I largely I agree with you. There probably are exceptions, but I feel like I've heard practitioners say things like, I've come a long way. I never dreamed that um, my practice would develop this way when I was st- when I was preparing for it originally back in whatever medical school or um, we, you and I have met a lot of men and women who are doing career changes. Yes. And uh, sometimes very dramatic career changes. I've, I know many clergy who have reti- retired or resigned from the actual clergy function and uh, are moving over into human resources or st- starting a business for themselves or something. Some of those individuals are having to deal with feelings of guilt personal guilt at having resigned from the clergy Mm -hmm. that they should have somehow been able to, they should have been able to transcend uh, the challenges that they were experiencing that finally led them to drop out of the program, out of the, that, that particular practice, but nothing, plenty of other changes that are perhaps not as dramatic as that, as, as, as moving from being, a minister to a human resources person in the secular world. But um, a, a lot of, from the point of view of the individual, the feeling is of, of dramatic change and of turning their lives around. So we're, what, we're, what we've involved ourselves in here is a pretty complex subject and uh, I'm sure our listeners are experiencing that for themselves in terms of their own ideas about their own practice. I would like to be heard by them as being very supportive of their efforts to improve their practice. However, that how that whatever that means for them, that all where you and I are doing here is is um, identifying the issues. And, and trying to uh, put them in a context of the understanding of practice. I have a, uh, I have a, a, a flash of thought. I picture a person in two parallel states. Sound like Stephen King here with, you know, uh, two worlds, you know, clashing. But <laughs> one state is a state of mind, which we've said earlier, a mindful. That state is, I am in practice. I am practicing. I am a practitioner. The other state that runs right alongside that you can flip over to pretty quickly is, I'm out of that practice. Uh, I'm no longer that. I'm going to be something else. Uh, And there's a lot in between. As you mentioned with clergy, they're sort of on the fence. Do I stay? Do I go? Uh, But it's like holding your mind in the I am in practice state so you don't flip over to that other dimension where you suddenly lose your consciousness of being in practice. And I've I've experienced it. It just goes away. And you've got to say, okay, wait a minute. I still am striving to be an excellent teacher. So get back up there, put that on and keep keep learning on that, keep seeking those results. So that's just a little bit of your stalt that I'm offering, um, sort of in and out of practice, moment to moment. Does that make any sense? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've, I have not read Stephen King, partly because I've, <laughs> I've got a tender, I'm, impress, I'm easily impressed and easily kept awake at night. <laughs> oh yeah, he'd keep you up. Oh, I have not for a subjected week. <laughs> myself to Stephen King, um, but I I see what you're saying, and uh, you know it's interesting. Sometimes thinking of of these many individuals sitting in one of our classes or one of our training programs, they stick their hand up and say, "Yeah, but but how about?" 
in practice? You're giving us the theory, Professor Vail, but what about practice? And and in that instant, they are flipping from a growth and development mode to a more hard-nosed practitioner mode who's not who's not going to have a bill of goods put over on them. Um, because in my experience, this idea of, yeah, but what about in practice, Professor Vale? You're fine with theory, but what about practice? What about the trenches? What about the firing line? That that's kind of said defensively, so to speak, to right, to right. keep to keep from being from being uh, sold a bill of goods, uh, whatever. Inveigled, drawn and, in. Uh, you know, in our private moments, we are completely sympathetic to that feeling. That's why we're making these podcasts. That's right. Because we think that practice has not gotten its fair due of understanding and and reflection and conjecture. And uh, so that hopefully after listening to these podcasts, one will never say, what about in practice, Professor Vale, again, but instead we'll make a more reflective conjecture about how whatever I'm saying or whatever you're saying or whatever some trainer or educator is saying, uh, how that kind of is going down and and uh, how it fits with the individual's idea about practice. And it can lead to a more productive conversation than simply firing off, what about in practice? What about in the trenches? Because I think at the, at the gist of, at the basis of that um, sort of uh, charge, to you or to me is, hey, this is just theory. It's not going to have any use for me. That is their choice. And if, they, if their intention is to go through the experience with us and glean something and put it into their practice going forward, if that intention is there, mm -hmm. then we can work with it. Uh, and so we need to continue to encourage others that, you're going to get a lot more out of what you read or what you watch, or what you listen to. If you're setting your mind on make use of this, put it into my practice rather than this is not relevant. I don't get it. Uh, it's just a bill of goods that, that is being uh, sold to me. So I guess I'm harping on this whole notion that an individual practitioner has tremendous amount of power over themselves and any of us who are trying to explain something because they can rule it out or rule it in. Mm -hmm. Somehow I'm, you're reminding me of, of another dimension of this whole subject, and that's the, um, the uh, skill that a practitioner needs to have in working with people who, who he or she encounters in their practice. This is one of the things I don't think we've given as much attention to in our podcast so far as, um, as it warrants. As, it, it, in my opinion, practice, practice of almost any kind, except maybe the, sol maybe the solitary carpenter who is building a boat in his basement or something, um, but practice of almost any kind uh, deeply involves the practitioner in uh, relationships with others. Yes. Uh, clients, competitors, colleagues, suppliers, teachers, and that in those encounters, the practitioner's interpersonal skill, self-awareness, sensitivity to the needs of the other is of great importance. And I don't think in education for practice, as I know it, which is principally in business schools, my sense is that the developing practitioners who are majoring in something like accounting or, or finance or marketing or whatever, aren't hearing enough about the absolute 
centrality of relationships in in conducting the practice right and so when we talk about developing and changing oneself and developing one's conscious ability we're really talking about improving relationships with others yes and that's conducted with some self-awareness it's conducted with certainly some sensitivity that needs to the needs of others there are tons of training programs out there about how to get along with people most of those probably are not really linked to a set of issues that might arise in a given practice that's right but um that practitioner who's trying to meet the growing and changing needs of the practice as it as it exists in their in their circumstances that practitioner is acutely aware of the growing and changing needs and and in those moments it tends to present those with whom you need to relate it's sort of like they pop up you know if i'm very focused on uh, a, a skill that i'm not getting the increases that i i wish and i re- realize the the real consequences of not having that skill at the right level then i know that i'm going to be looking for people related to that need so in a way with the with the um, designers of our own learning curriculum in that regard uh and and therefore being able to relate easily and well is not going to be just to the predictable few it could be an expert it could be someone standing next to you at a bus station and you and you have a map and you can't figure out how to get from a to b uh and and i would uh, break into this train of thought just a moment to tell you that a few podcasts ago i uh i re- relayed a little story about my work with the town clerks on yeah. living a practice life and right I, and i mentioned at the end of that uh that i gave them each a, a plastic egg with silly putty in it so here's the here's the point I was invited by a former student of mine who's teaching introduction to management right at my school if to come in and spend 30 minutes or so with these sophomores uh and give them something. So I grabbed my little surplus of eggs and I gave each one of the 30 students a silly putty egg. And then I wrote up on the on the board in very large letters impression And then I said, "Notice that the egg is closed. That is your mind at a given moment. <laughs> Close tight. Open it and peek in. There's that putty. But in this moment, it has not anything on it. There's no scratches. There's no fingerprints. There's nothing. It's just unformed. Mm-hmm. And then the exercise." which you had suggested uh, was okay pair up and tell each other something that you love doing so much that you do it no matter what whether you're paid for it or whether it was easy you just love doing it and why you're listening i want you to open that egg in front of the other person and then as that person is coming across to you and you're feeling their passion or not just put a little fingerprint on that it on on that silly putty and then the other person did it then we talked about it but i said notice this every time you open yourself up to a conversation to interaction with others you are giving them a chance to make an impression on you call it knowledge call it learning and you're to the extent that they're open to you <coughs> making an impression on them over a lifetime your little lump of silly putty is going to have a lot of different shapes and a lot of different marks and hopefully thousands of positive fingerprints uh that record how you're becoming better at whatever you wish to become keep that egg closed don't give just give people a little peek 
take but don't give, you're not going to make it. I think that I think the students got it. My colleague told me in a follow up the next week that they were quite, they got really talking a lot, and they all and and every one of them took their eggs with them. <laughs> yeah. So. I don't know me in my in my trying to create these little gimmicky visual activities, but I think the gist of it was what you're saying to me, and that is that the uh, relationships that we need, we, we require to really do that growing, are part and parcel of our success. Sermon over. <laughs> <laughs> you're reminding me of um, of an epigram. The world is composed of two kinds of people, givers and takers. Mm -hmm. the, giver, the givers know this, and the takers don't. And you, um, your exercise dramatizes the need to be a giver. Yes. Uh, and that you can't be a successful taker if you're not an energetic giver. And uh, that, I think, is the kind of interpersonal skill that uh, a sound practitioner practices. The ability to learn from others while sharing the benefits of their own practice with those individuals takes me back to one of my concerns about this whole enterprise we're involved in. All these practitioners who have been sitting in our classes and in our training programs they may have a lot to give, but we have not been giving them the opportunity to give That's right. their knowledge of practice. We've been tending, and I think a lot of our colleagues also tend to give these practitioners, to treat these practitioners as, as every other student and nothing special about the fact that they've got 20 years of experience with a particular practice. So, so we make them sit there with their shelves closed and just pay attention and listen to us. Brilliant so-and-sos telling them what, what life's all about. The more that they not only open up to us, but to each other, the more they're going to learn this interpersonal practice that we've uh, struck upon here uh, in this conversation. Well, I'm looking at the clock and uh, we want to, try to pull a few more threads together to conclude this, but it sets us up for some very interesting conversations next. Increasingly was the modification that you're working into our way of thinking about practice. Increasingly, which gets at intention and attitude. Uh -huh. okay. Well, I think we're not done until we're not done with our own efforts, whether we put them on these podcasts or not, is another matter. But we need to craft a way of thinking that recognizes uh, that not all practitioners are the same, mm -hmm. that we um, are not expecting practitioners to be um, heroes, develop developmental geniuses, but just learners like... Uh, all the rest of us. So that's, that's ahead of us, is, yes. to, is, to get, is to get a way of thinking crafted that, that recognizes that fact. And that the intention, to me, I still say, the intention is what takes ordinary effort and gives it that special learning recipe. The more I intend to put together something that an individual calls a practice. Anything can be called a practice as long as their intention is to continually work toward increasingly challenging results. Mm -hmm. So that from us is the people who like to give is what we look for. Just that spark of intention to explore more deeply what they've gotten their heads into, whether it's golf or running or uh, nursing of some aspect of nursing or preaching, but we're acknowledging that we've said it many times now, there are many moments when those changing circumstances set us back to beginner level again. 
So that's what I find to be even most encouraging that just when we think that we've got it all figured out and we're at the top of the heap, <laughs> the heap becomes, it heaps on us. <laughs> it heaps on us. <laughs> morphs into something else. We're at the bottom of the heap. And so we have that beginner status again. But that's pretty, uh, uh, so therefore all those people we look up to, and I, there are many I look up to, uh, when I've gotten to know them, as I have you, we find humility and a good sense of humor about how stuff happens. <laughs> I would say the word shit, but I wouldn't want to put that out on a podcast. But it does happen. <laughs> you wouldn't, eh? <laughs> Final thoughts. You're right. Stuff does happen. And uh, it seems to me an effective practitioner understands that. It's, the, the practice is never going to be what he or she may ideally wish it would be. I think those those rep, those are my final thoughts. And I would add to that, and thank goodness, what the heck fun would it be to be in life? <laughs> and you think exactly the way you want whatever it is that you can do very well. And you say, okay, it's done. Give me the certificate. Put the plaque on the wall. Yeah. Then what? You know? So hopefully we fall in line with practices that never let us feel completely accomplished. And therefore we're never going to stop learning and meeting very interesting people on the way because we can't learn alone. So Peter, thank you for another great conversation. I look forward to our next one. And, thank uh, you, Dave. We're doing well here. I think <laughs> we haven't figured it all out yet. We got more work to do.